them in no particular order. I had about three questions if there's time. Yes. Um, when you see people with Meniere's that is due to a uh, cranial nerve damage from chemotherapy, for instance. Um, okay. And at least it's not been officially, but the deafness is there and the person was prone to Meniere's. Mm -hmm. So how would you go about treating that? Are you going to look at treating something that would treat the nerves? Are you going to look at something that's going to clear the young? Uh, <laughs> Okay. I guess you'd be palpating to figure out what the body is telling you, but I'm wondering if you can field some sort of question along those lines. Yeah, no, no. I, I think, yes, I'm always palpating the body to get to get some more clues. But I, I'm very strongly, I'm a very strong proponent of don't just say palpate the body and treat what you find, as in if they have this by dogma, they have adrenal, treat adrenal. If they have, you know, because the body, first of all, the body can lie, number one, okay? Uh, just like anything else. So I'm treating the abdomen or the neck and, the, and et cetera, like um, say a good pulse diagnostician would put, treat the pulse. If you remember your, you know, your first year di diagnosis class, Camille, you can chime in because I know you taught those. Um, the, the, the principle is you do not rely on one method of diagnosis only. And it's a mistake to say, I'm the greatest pulse person in the world. And I can, I mean, even John Shen, okay, who could tell you that you had gallbladder surgery in 1954 and it was a rainy day or whatever and blah, 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 blah. And your mother didn't visit you and you were upset. Okay, I mean, he really literally did that to people. He, he would say the weirdest things. You know, there are a lot of people who can do a lot. There's a fair amount of people who are capable of telling you what drugs you're taking from the pulse, from, from your pulse. They know nothing about you. They're doing, doing this, you know, like shamanistic thing. But to rely on that solely is not a good thing because you have other avenues of information. That's why, you know, there's, I believe it, it's called four methods of um, diagnosis, the questions, the palpation, the looking, and there is something else. Listening. <laughs> Listening. No, I, there's not questions. That's not the same as if you're listening to the answers, I would have thought that comes together. Maybe a smelling, I think, maybe something. There's observation, smelling, Listen, Listening is different than asking. Asking is the 10 questions, but listening are things like listening to how, how loudly or softly someone speaks or how loud their cough is or soft, that kind of thing. Fair enough. Okay. I, yeah, I see for me, it's all like, that's an observation. So, okay, fair enough. So, but whatever, so you see, I don't even know what the four methods of diagnosis are, <laughs> but I know there's, I believe there's supposed to be four and you're not supposed to rely on one only. You're supposed to really um, rely on all four of them. So that said, with Meniere's, so yes, the patient will come and they'll say they, you know, and by the way, there are people there, you don't find anything in their abdomen, it can happen. Now you may find something in their neck or you may. So with Meniere's, first of all, I, I'm always under the impression that this, is Meniere's considered an autoimmune disorder? because I believe it is. Yes, in this case it is. Yes. So the biggest part of the diagnosis that jumps right to the top is the fact an autoimmune disorder is, um, is very high on my priority list because it's very rooted constitution, okay? Diabetes would be, thyroid issues would be, autoimmune issues would be, you know, there are certain things that just jump up as in if you don't treat them because they affect every cell in the body. Okay? So if you don't treat them, you can do the weirdest things to the, to the nerve. You know, you can, you can find their nerve and put the, the needles right on the nerve and pass the right amount of electricity in between those needles to regenerate the nerve. I'm, I'm bullshitting obviously, right? And yet, because there's an autoimmune component, it's gonna come and invade it constantly. So no matter what, you're doing the right thing, you're generating the right tissue, assuming that you can, in the place that you need to, and yet the body is gonna go and the terrain is, you know, the tsunami is gonna come again and again and again, kind of thing. So that, so one of those so-called tsunamis, things that constantly influence the body is an autoimmune disorder. 
it's it's a consistent inflammation. So my the autoimmune um, now there's a connection by the way with Meniere's that's a little separate and I'll go through that in a second. So autoimmune, for example, does not have real uh, reflexes on the body. We don't say here is a reflex. And if you have this, of course you have autoimmune. Okay, so for example, we say if you have below kidney 16, just below kidney 16, that's called the adrenal reflex, both sides, we say, oh, that we call adrenal. And it's possible that it's also related to the spleen and the small intestine because both of those can reflect around the navel too, granted. Um, but if it's specifically just below kidney 16 on both sides, we say adrenal and Therefore, here is our protocol for adrenal, which originally was kidney six and 27. Fabulous. We don't have that kind of reflex for, um, auto, for autoimmune disorders. However, there are two things that, uh, well, three things that can often show. Um, first of all, their sacroiliac ligaments tend to have ropiness. So when you palpate the sacroiliac ligament, usually when they're lying face down, you feel like, wow, there's like, ping pong balls, you know, between the sacrum and ilium or, or an ilium site. What, what, what's going on here? Uh, the other thing is they often under the mastoid, around the mastoid, they'll have puffiness. That's fairly typical for autoimmune. And another thing that sometimes happens, actually, that's not so typical at all, but people who do have red dots around the neck, around here, around REN22, um, will sometimes have autoimmune disorders. They're more likely to have an autoimmune disorder than anything else. But I don't have any, so besides the, uh, the um, mastoid and the sacroiliac, I don't, those are the only two that I can say are likely to lead me to try and treat autoimmune, but it's not like a clear finding, but it's something that helps me understand that it's, leads me towards autoimmune, but usually people come and they say, yes, it's autoimmune. I have these markers in my blood. You know, I have this name disease. So the treatment for autoimmune is this. Um, you're clearing, autoimmune is considered a systemic inflammation. So you're clearing inf inflammation systemically, which means you want to use water because water overcomes fire. And you want to use metal because metal is the mother of water which means it, it strengthens, strengthens water's ability to clear fire, okay? So that's metal and water. If it wasn't a particular channel, we choose the metal and water points, okay? So for example, if you have a channel that the fire point on it is painful, that's a big concept um, in this style. If the fire point on pressure is painful, you do the metal water points for that channel. Um, that Two channels that are different are um, the small intestine channel, you use heart three rather than the small intestine one and two. And the heart channel, uh, often we use small intestine nine, 10, between nine and 10 on the back uh, to clear. Heart eight is very unusual to find pain on, extremely unusual. Um, but pericardium and kidney channels are very, very often you find pain at least, you know, often just one side. So you use the metal and water point. In the case of pericardium, it's pericardium three and five. In case of kidney, it's kidney seven and 10. Spleen and liver are fairly common. Okay, so leaving that aside, because that's not what autoimmune is. Uh, autoimmune treatment, in, you take the same principle of using metal and water points, but you're using it systemically, which means kidney is water and lung is metal. So using kidney points and lung points. Typically it will be something like kidney seven, kidney nine, kidney six, maybe two of the three, something like that. If they have kidney two pain, if there's pressure pain on kidney two, so they have fire point pain, then you use um, metal water, kidney seven and 10 together. On the lungs, it's either lung five or lung eight or lung nine. One of those three or possibly lung five and lung eight. If they have pressure pain on lung 10, I take lung 10, not, not on the edge of the bone, but more like behind large intestine um, four. Okay, that's our lung four. Then, so that's your metal water. And then you go to the small intestine mu point, which is REN4 and your needle REN4 because it's a systemic fire, so to speak. So you go to the young of fire 
And I know this sounds like very, like I'm the greatest five element practitioner ever. And I, the truth is I'm not, I don't, you know, I, I don't really follow all these, these, these cycles, but this is one treatment where it really does work. And often they'll have, they won't have the same, the same ropey or gumminess that they have on UB27 uh, area, which is the, um, um, the, the um, sacroiliac area, uh, ligaments. But under, when you press, you might find a little nodule. And you're, try, you're trying to sort of hit that nodule and break it down with a needle. So that's the treatment. And on the back, you would do, and then you can add things specifically for the ear. Okay, um, you know, heart three is a good point for ears. Sound gel three actually is very good point for mastoid. Okay, um, and then you, uh, and also use the immune points below large intestine 11 on the edge of the bone. So it's a little more towards the uh, triple warmer channel. Um, on the back, the translation of metal water, systemic, would be lung shu or outside lung shu. I tend to go for the outside of the lung shu unless the lung shu itself, UB13 itself is very ropey or you know something interesting there. And kidney shu <clears throat> or outside UB52. And again, I tend to go for UB52. I tend to needle UB52 inwards towards the spine and um, bladder 42 outside the lung shu, outside towards the scapula. And I use small intestine shu, UB27, which is basically anywhere at that point, I, do, I don't care. It's just anywhere on the um, sacroiliac ligaments and I can put two or three needles on each side, it's okay. Um, and by the way, UB26, which is the very top, the corner of the sacrum and the iliac crest, um, the, the um, um, superior lateral corner of the sacrum is UB26. And that's the name of UB26 is actually uh, Guan Yuan Shu. And Guan Yuan is the, rain, the name for Ren Fu. Okay, so um, so that's the official and and do fourteen uh, Watteau, which is equivalent to the immune point. So that's the official autoimmune treatment, and then I add for ears. So what I'd add for ears is um, possibly Sanjiao eight, one third below the elbow on the Sanjiao channel, um, and. Some people, Sanjiao 5 will do better, if, especially if they have rapid pulse, but usually it's Sanjiao 8, for me at least. Then um, <clears throat> Sanjiao 3, if they have very clearly on the mastoid something. And then the last, um, if they've, let's say they said, that I used to have ear infections as a child. In other words, this is what created the vulnerability for me. You know, or, or they're not saying it, but I'm thinking that's why you're vulnerable in the ears and your autoimmune didn't come out in the in the eyes or the nose or, you know, or in colitis or something. So what happens is um, if I do, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Oh, so if they had ear infections, I add spleen seven um, to the mix. The next thing is look under the armpit, all the way to go bladder 26, somewhere in the ribs, look for something that might affect the ear. So they may have pressure pain. Um, small intestine 19, go bladder two, um, Sanjiao 20, 19? I'm not sure where, where Sanjiao 20, I think is the name, the, the 21. You know, there's three points in front of the ear or Sanjiao 17 behind, which is more typical. Look for pressure pain there and look for something on the side of the body on the gallbladder channel. Go, you know, we'll call it gallbladder 22 for the sake of it, because that's like the big point um, and see if that fixes the, the ear. So that would kind of be, be my approach. And then yes, treat whatever else in the, in the history and cl that clears the abdomen. So get my clues from other things, but the dogma is basically treated as autoimmune and then go, go for ear points. Excellent, wow, thank you so much. I, there is actually a history of ear issues with having to put cotton balls in for, you know, avoiding wind in the ears, just being sensitive to getting earaches from walking around the block, that sort of thing. Oh. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Well, that, that's not quite the same as ear infections. I don't know. I mean, I, no, um, no infections, just uh, pain from, <laughs> I mean, walking. lifelong activities, just going out on a sailboat, just taking a walk around the block, sensitive to wind. Okay. 
uh, yeah, and for, you know, and of course, sensitive to wind is a very um, lovely phrase for any Chinese practitioner. It's totally, it's, it's a little bit, um, doesn't have quite the same, like, oh, yes, I got it. <laughs> you know, yeah. it doesn't have the yuping feng sound uh, effect on me. Um, <laughs> so, no, but, you know, I, so I, you know, here's what you want to do is consider whether um, this sensitivity that happens, is it an exertion phenomenon? You know, or, you know, and it could be just wind, just like, you know, you know, some people get health palsy and this person, you know, specifically got Meniere's instead. Um, you know, it's perfectly possible, you know, and then you can, you know, you can use what I said and then you can look at, okay, what else, what, what can I do for wind? You know, do I want to, for example, you know, would bladder 12 be useful? Or, um, um, wait, no, no, yeah, yeah. And um, small intestine 12 is another wind point. Thank you. So you have many, and especially because small intestine goes to the ear, you know, the, the channel itself. I mean, lots of channels, of course, go to the ear. Um, you know, but, you know, it's, you, you're talking primarily Sanja and, and gallbladder because of the location, even though lots of other channels go to the ear, it is a Shaoyang phenomenon, you know, and yeah, you know, your ears also, by the way, are, <laughs> there's this expression that like, your ears are a little bit like the gills of the fish, you know, or, or the, you know, they're the, your sonar, um, you know, so do you, do you see what I'm getting at? That this area under the armpit is not just that it's Shaoyang, that there's an extension of, the, of this, there's a resonance between the two. As you know, fish don't have necks. <laughs> no, no, you know, now I don't know if they have ears or don't, but they, they, they're hearing, and I believe they're hearing in, in an area that we would consider gallbladder 22. So, you know, you can, I mean, I don't know how closely we are related to fish, um, um, evolutionarily speaking, you know, I mean, I believe that we, we did come from fish, I, I don't know, um, but, but I believe that, you know, all, you know, all um, land uh, walkers have come from the ocean. Um, so there is some, you know, like sometimes it's very useful to look at like other kind of, you know, because, you know, like the ear is just such a um, highly developed structure that's so closely connected to, in, in, in our case, to the brain, both proximity wise and, and, and you know, nervally. But if you, you know, if you look at, you know, if you want to look at remote points and stuff, then you're looking at something like a fish and you're going, oh, well, gee, you know, their hearing hmm, kind of relates to gallbladder 22 area. So then it gives you an idea. Oh, I, maybe I can use this point and it's effective. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. and another point that could be very useful, which is actually part of this area, is at the very bottom is um, uh, liver 13, the spleen wall. Okay. Um, that's a point that's very good for ears and ears and mastoid in general. Okay. And needle that sort of uh, almost like in and uh, outwards. You know, not towards the abdomen, but outwards. Okay. Just the liver thirteen. Liver thirteen, Abby, was it? Liver thirteen. Yeah, this the spleen. Uh, Zhang men. Um, I I believe that's thirteen. Yeah, because there's fourteen points on the liver. And yeah. Uh, Qi men, Zhang men. Yeah. Yeah, thirteen. So when you say outward, you mean posterior? Outwards meaning slightly laterally, slightly posteriorly. Uh, what's yeah? I mean, to, towards the back, yeah, because there's nowhere okay. else to go. <laughs> right, but right. Rather, That's why rather than towards yeah. the ren channel, towards the gallbladder channel. Okay. It's not a huge issue, but you know, it's just that you know, it, it's may not be. I mean, especially if you're using a thicker and a longer needle, it you know, it then it, it kind of becomes an you know. Um, an abdominal point almost. Okay. It's like I, I'm not that comfortable with, you know, and you know, in case somebody has a very enlarged liver or something, I don't know. Um I'm not sure why I picked up that trick of, of needling it that way. Okay. But that's what I, 
I have a, a follow up question. Yes. So, so what Tamara is describing, I mean, she mentioned it was due to chemo. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that, that sounds very typical of um, platinum poisoning from, uh, you know, chemo drugs like cisplatin and carboplatin. So if hypothetically it were a platinum situation, how, how would you change your treatment or, or what, what else would you do? Um, oh boy. Um, so I would want, that's really interesting. My first reaction was I want, I'd want to make sure that the Western kidneys are working really well. Uh, and then I'm, you know, and of course the kidneys and, and in, for us and the ears are highly correlated. Um, so yeah, because you, you want to get the stuff out through, you know, your, yes, your liver detoxifies, but your kidneys do too. The, the two are highly correlated. Um, and, you know, especially when you're seeing people with problems in, in, in the kidneys, there are often people who've had liver problems before. Um, so that's also interesting. But um, so either kidney seven or kidney nine directly affects the kidney as an organ. And since it's, you know, you want to detoxify, I would cons consider the possibility of kidney nine and large intestine 15, the protocol for detoxification. Um, I would check their thyroid. Um, and, you know, just to make sure that there isn't anything, um, because, you know, with drugs, always check liver and thyroid um, because that, those are, they are going to be metabolized that there. Uh, I would definitely check the liver very, very well. And yeah, I'm sorry, I missed, I, I do remember now that you said it was a result of chemo and I kind of missed that part. Um, so the tooth, so I would start looking at, because with cancer also always treat thyroid and liver, make sure the thyroid and liver are, are good and that REN12 is, is, oh, is doing well also, um, meaning the stomach. Um, because if you don't have good um, digestion, good en enzymatic action, um, you know, that then cancer, you know, it's much harder for the cancer to be uh, eroded or, or um, uh, eaten away, so it's sort of broken down. Um, so, um, so, so you have your immune point, which is also for REN12, and we talked about it already, but um, stomach chi point might be very useful for REN12, and REN12 is also affected by kidney points. So we're all, all we've added with that extra component at this point is, is stomach chi. For cancer itself, I tend to do liver nine or go to the kidney channel, which would be a point that we call inner yin. Um, and I would definitely check the liver and treat the liver. So you have a number with liver, you have a whole bunch of options. Usually liver with cancer is going to be a liver excess condition. Um, and that's going to fall as, which means that when you, when you poke, it's sharp pain. And um, what I would do is um, right side kidney seven, spleen seven, and right side heart three and pericardium four, three fingers below pericardium three. That's like the official... Uh, liver excess, you know, physical liver excess treatment. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Uh, if you could turn it to me, I guess I'd say um, the other question I woke with today had to do with people that are dealing with PTSD and or anxiety, is that's going to be so prevalent? Is there a component for people that cannot forgive themselves for what has happened, maybe holding on to some responsibility or, you know, is that issue of non-forgiveness for themselves? How would you treat that in a, wow. in a patient? <laughs> All right. Well, you know, there's it's too and I just just from my from myself, okay. To me, those are two different questions. The lack of ability to forgive oneself is not necessarily, it can be complicating PTSD, a trauma, but PTSD, you know, I, I don't necessarily see them as related. So I'm not sure what you're, you know, and I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. I'm, I'm just saying that I don't. So you're seeing something that you, you're making an association that isn't so clear to me. 
Um, so I can't totally, <sighs> well, just take the first one then lack of ability to forgive oneself. That's yeah. Okay. Fair enough. That's what I was going to try and run with that, which is very hard also. <laughs> so here is, this will be a little bit, um, uh, controversial maybe. I think that acupuncture, I think that there are definitely people who believe, I, I don't think, I know that there are people who believe that you, you can direct your acupuncture treatment towards an issue like that, and they can come up with points by names or by whatever um, that will address that. And there's many ways to look at that. Okay, so for example, you can say if you can't forgive yourself, it can have something to do with how you you stand up to the world and therefore it can have something to do with the yin chow or the yang chow. And you can analyze that further. And since it's about forgiving yourself, it's 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 directed towards the yin, the me. You know, you can say it's yin chow. It's that, you know, you can go you can go a whole route that way. And that's totally fine. I, my end, with someone like that, if someone, that is like their major problem, I change hats at that point. Because I think that, especially if they defined it that way, it means that they're, you know, they're, it's not that acupuncture is only good for physical issues. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not, I, that's where it's controversial. I'm not saying that, and I also don't want to say acupuncture is very good for us, you know, like a spiritual issues are, you know, I don't, I don't want to classify acupuncture and limit it that way. But so what's very clear to me is that acupuncture provides space just about every patient you have on the table. Once you get over the fear of needles or whatever, or the anticipation or whatever, or anxiety, it's a new practitioner or whatever, just about everyone like gets a certain kind of space within them for a certain period of time, okay? That's very rare that even as a meditator, I can say that acupuncture gives you a deeper, a different kind of space, a deeper kind of space. So I think that what you, you could conceivably say, I'm just giving you that space. And as long as we're focused, as long as you're aware that our intention is around forgiveness for yourself, then the process will happen. And then you could conceivably, and I will, I, it's not coming up for me right now, but I could come up with, I mean, yes, you can go with lung points, for example. Lung is about letting go. Um, I mean, I, I could, you know, give me a, give me time for next week and I'll, I'll try, I'll come up with stuff because nothing is coming up right this second. Because in the way I work with people with that is it's, it's mostly, um, quote unquote, God forbid, I should say that psycho, a psychotherapy session. In other words, I would talk to them a fair amount more and set up the stage. And only then um, when we do the needles and I might, if, if I had ideas about connotations of points and stuff, I would explain those to them so that they can make their own um, understanding of what, what, you know, of what's happening in the treatment or just, or just follow the rest of the medical history and clear with that, use that to clear the abdomen or follow the abdomen, you know, and just do what I do. And just like people who do four gates and trust that there, there's some space is gonna open up for that person, okay? And within that space, they'll be able to hopefully process, you know, this issue of forgiveness. Um, the last thing I will say is that there is no such thing as forgiveness except forgiveness for oneself unless you're a lawyer, okay? If you're a lawyer, you, you go and ask someone to forgive your client and you say, I'll give you, you know, I want you to forgive him or her and we will give you this, that, and the other in exchange. There's an exchange involved, you know, like treaties between countries after wars or something, you know, or like, you know, when dictators are get overthrown, you know, you, you, you forgive, you, you make forgiveness. But that's not actual forgiveness. That's contracts. Okay. So forgiveness, even though you, I say that person hurt me or that institution hurt me and I can, it's always about forgiving myself for having been caught in that situation. There's no, there's never blame in forgiveness. So 
because of that, all that really matters is it's almost like to direct the treatment is almost counterintuitive because what you want to do is you want to create a mind, a mind as in the Chinese mind, the heart mind, that is always expansive, that's never contracting, that's never going, to, never going into the, the, the blame game, whether it's the blame myself or the blame the other. Because a f forgiveness is, is, is ba to me, the word forgiveness means total acceptance. Okay, I accept the fact that I was, it was screwed up. It, it was fucked. It was a terrible situation for me and I ended up with these traumas that I'm still carrying. So for that, you have to have a mind that's, that's not latching on to anyone specific, the mind that's always willing to, to, to be larger. And in my experience, acupuncture generally creates that for the amount of time that they're on the table at least. So you're giving them that experience. And if that experience takes root or they're able to process a t even a tiny something, it doesn't have to be rational in any way. You know, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't need to be verbalized anyway. Then it starts opening. And then one, one gets used to a more spacious mind. And a more spacious mind is a mind that naturally forgives because it naturally accepts, it naturally embraces, it embraces everything. That's what an open mind is, the ability to embrace everything. Um, unfortunately, I don't have, um, I can't come up with a, with a cute protocol right the second for that. Um, PTSD is a lot easier to come up with protocols for in a way. Uh, and we had this um, a, a few months ago and somebody gave a big criticism about, well, all these acupuncturists think they can treat PTSD, but you know, it's a much more complicated phenomenon the acupuncturists think and blah, blah, it was very odd. Uh, so, I mean, I, it's not, I, I understand what they're saying in a sense, but um, so th these are these are issues that often require more than just acupuncture. Is basically what you know, I, I think is fair to say. Does that make sense? That's a wonderful answer. I really appreciate your comments. No problem. Can I? I'll I'll yield the floor if anyone else has a burning question, or if we're out of time, I don't know. But I have one more quick text. We have fifteen I... minutes. We're good. <laughs> oh, okay, great. Um, a technique question then. When you're examining the hara. Is it sort of a quick and light uh, survey that you're, you're taking in or do you go deep? Are you pausing? Are you doing things at length? I know you can't go through and cover it more than. Okay, than no, no, I, okay. So uh, you, there's actually, um, there's videos of classes that I do and it, there, there's an introduction to the style. And then on the, the second, the, it's three videos. One of them is just pure demonstration of a treatment. And after the second video, there's a demonstration of just, me going through the abdomen. Now, for me, the way I work, this is my influence was Kiko Matsumoto, okay? So I don't, a lot of Japanese just palpate very lightly and they're interested in whether it's damp or warm or dry or cold or blah, you know, that kind of stuff that then maybe they're, they're just touching on the surface to see if there's nodules. What I do is very much what MDs used to do, say, in the 1920s, 30s, 40s of the last century. <laughs> so um, you're actually palpating, you know. So you want to be able to get um, up the, the depth of one knuckle. I use three fingers, um, pericardium, large intestine, and sanjar fingers. And my pericardium finger is the, my sensing finger for me. I don't use my thumb. That doesn't work for me. Um, and, and also it's, it's a little bit more wider area. And so even though my pericardium finger is the finger that's really um, going down more perhaps and, and is sensing, I use all three fingers so there's a wider, a more diffuse sensation. And you should be able to get on most people up to one knuckle in without creating pain. If there is a discomfort or pain, that, that means I found something. Okay, and the advantage of that is then the patient knows you found something and the patient can give you feedback when you try and eliminate it. The patient can say, oh yeah, 
when you're pressing on my leg now, my abdomen is totally fine. So I press, I take the picture of the whole abdomen. I palpate the whole abdomen if at all possible. Um, sometimes, you know, I kind of get excited or something, but ideally I, I get all my findings first of the abdomen. The neck, I don't palpate that way. I palpate more with the flat of my hand because it's, uh, it's a little more sensitive up here. Um, I get all my findings and I decide on points that I want to try. I press on a point, now I repalpate the sensitive points and ask them how much better is it. That's my, the way I work. Other people, you know, they just, they say, oh, I felt this hardness and now the hardness is dissolving and they do, and, and that's how they decide on points. That's okay. That's fine too. Um, but I actually get, do get the patient involved because I think it's, um, the placebo effect is extremely useful. If they feel like, oh my God, it's much better. You know, if you tell a patient, oh, your pulse is much stronger, they have to believe you, you know, to, to get that effect. Oh, I'm getting better. But if they could feel their pulse, if they could feel the pulse and go, oh my God, the pulse is great. It's amazing. You know, you're giving them, you know, they're getting their own confirmation that way. So the palpation I do is, some, is somewhat invasive. It should not, however, be painful except if there's an area where, um, you know, some people literally jump off the table. Yes, it happens. Um, but, for, you know, and that's why often I would go, unless they have um, uh, ulcerative colitis or something like that, I go to the left side on the spleen area, like spleen 14 area, and press there, or even outside the spleen line, and say, this is what my fingers feel like. Okay, so they know. For some people are very ticklish and they're very jittery and you know every place you you know so they kind of oh okay that's one. and it's it's relatively steady I mean it's not like I'm not pressing you know I'm pressing boom home you know and I'm pressing with my whole body I'm using my whole body I'm not I'm not actually having any tension in my hand I'm not pushing my hand in I'm pushing my whole body in. Okay, I stand with my legs slightly apart or fairly apart actually, and bend my knee, at least one knee, and I'm moving from my heart, or some people will say they're moving from the hara, from their abdomen, into the into the body of the other person. I'm not I'm not doing this with my hand, I'm doing this with my body. My hand is moving as a result of my body moving with my wrist and elbow as uh, loose as possible. The moment I tighten the, the wrist or the elbow or the shoulder, uh, and of course, the further away it is, the less it's going to be felt by the patient. But the moment you tighten the, the hand, the patient can totally feel the difference. You know, they, they'll tell you, oh my, that, that's not pleasant. And then if you let, release the hand and you press from your body, unless there's something problematic with that point there, they're going to say, oh no, that's fine. So you just need to experiment. Um, it's um, you have to find exercises uh, of on leaning. <laughs> you know, just lean into the table, lean into the table, lean into the table, and then you put a person, you know, or put a pillow on the table and lean into it. Then eventually, I mean, you know, it's it, it's not. You know, I would start palpating maybe people that you trust are not going to like criticize you too too strongly. You know, not like the a new patient that when you know, and that's the first time you're palpating. It may not be the best time, you know. You know, if you're not comfortable, you know, some people are very comfortable with palpation, but if you're not, just practice on other people that you know, family members, friends, whatever. Um, you know, and I, I will do it that way. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Very good. All right. Anyone else, Mary Jo? Did you have? <clears throat> yeah. Um, is it your experience, Evie, that if somebody doesn't improve on the table, uh, that there isn't any likelihood it will happen during the week? You know, that it's, you know, is it in your experience like immediate if, if you're getting a result? Not always. For the most part, yes, but I would say I, I've had patients that did not get results on the table and they swear that they got results the next day or, you know, like, and I, I have a few patients that come and say, 
oh, it always works better the next day. I mean, I clear the abdomen, I can, but they're telling I me, mean, to me, it looks like I cleared it on the table sometimes. To them, it doesn't, you know, to them, it looks like the, the treatment takes effect two days later, you know, or a day later or whatever. I have, you know, all I can do is try and get the best results. I And listen, there are symptoms you can't get results on the table. You only, only the results we're talking about is clearing the abdomen, you know? Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, I, okay. So when I was, when I started using the style, you know, about 30 years ago, just about, I would be able to get rid of people's symptoms, but not necessarily clear. I would be able to clear the abdomen on the table, but then the next week they'll come and they have this exact same abdomen. Over time, I, I actually, at one point, I was like joking about the, that it reversed. I was able to clear the abdomens in a much more consistent way and they would come back and the abdomen would be fine, but the symptoms would, you know, took the symptoms longer. And I think that's partially has to do with my ego, the stage that I'm in, what I'm aiming at subconsciously, and also what kind of patients you're getting. You know, if you're getting a lot of patients that really come for knee pain, relatively quick and simple knee pains, you're going to probably be able to address their symptoms a lot more easily. And most of us as beginning acupuncturists tend to get that more. Because, you know, a lot of the people with uh, complicated cancers and autoimmune disorders and whatever other chronic degenerative diseases, they don't want to come to the to the third year acupuncturist. They want to go to the big expert, um, you know, and especially when I lived in San Francisco, there were tons of big experts way beyond me, you know, that, you know, that, that, had, that they had staked reputations. So um, you're getting different patients and over time, you know, the patient that you used to treat for knee pain now, you know, well, 20 years later, they're older and have chronic degenerative diseases. So it could be that, but ideally, Yes, there are people whom I can't move their abdomen. There are people whom it does not appear, they're coming for pain, let's say, shoulder pain. I have not affected the shoulder pain much. And yet they come back next week and say, yeah, it was so much better. And I'm like, oh, you know, so I, all I can say, I, you know, you do what you can with it. It's really nice if it happens on the table. The placebo effect works both directions. My placebo, <laughs> That I want to feel good about it. If it happens on the table, I feel good about it. If it happens the next day, how do I know that they didn't take their turmeric forte pills and got better from it? I, you know, it's, it's not as it's not as nice for me. But you know, I recognize it's just my ego. And then there's people who like they're great on the table, everything's fabulous, and then it all comes back a few hours later, even though you cleared everything in the abdomen and that okay, style patients suggest that you you got cheated you know they cheated at you in some way you didn't see what's you're missing a component you just have to to figure out what component you 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 know you, you haven't calculated here so find a new strategy you know um but yeah some people will not get better on the table and still will get better later um but i'm not counting on that yeah. You know, well, this, fact, this, this person actually mostly succeeded, I think, in uh, clearing the abdomen. Mm -hmm. But uh, they came with a complaint of, uh, well, she described it as sciatica, mm -hmm. uh, left side sciat sciatica, kind of um, sometimes moved to the right and shooting pains down uh, the left leg that particular day. And to the sole of the foot. So I kind of did most, you know, I mean, I cleared most, most things in the abdomen and did the back treatment with the usual things. And um, bending over was a, a problem. She could actually generate the pain, just like bending, bending forward. Mm -hmm. And um, when she got off the table, it was not any better. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. That so what you do, so, okay. So when you, when that happens, which is extremely frustrating, I mean, you know, I would pull the non hair that I have out. Um, so what I do is I start working with them standing up and see what I can do. And if, if I don't have time, I'll just put press tags. So things that I, you know, so for example, um, it sounds like in her case, it comes from L4, L4, L5. 
Okay. It was kind of rubbing the like the sacroiliac area, and then when she got up, she said like it was across the sacrum. Okay, but the thing is, it's the reason why I'm thinking it's L4, L5 is because it's going down to the foot, and she gets numb. Did you say she gets numbness in the foot or something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That suggests that L5 is involved. Okay. okay. So therefore, so yeah, you know, so the, this is the thing about treatment. I tr the first, especially the first time. I treat the first time, and I go. Well, second time, I don't know. All I know is I cleared or did not clear the abdomen. Next time, when let, let's not talk about the fact that somebody comes with pain. Let's say they're coming for um, digestive issues. What are you going to do? Give them grapes and olives and and hummus to 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 test out their digestive issue? It's it's not going to work that way, you know. So you're going to have to wait to know if the proof is in the pudding. Mm -hmm. The pudding doesn't come until a week later. So in a case with pain, the, the pudding comes at the end of the treatment, they're bending over. So now you have another chance. But I always tell people the second treatment is when I actually do the evaluation and redesign the treatment if need be. So what happens, they stand up and they bend over and now you say, okay, so let's see, what did I forget? Oh shit, I forgot, maybe spleen nine will do a good job. It's supposed to be good for L4, L5. So I press spleen nine upwards, have her bend over and she says, oh, okay. You know, at that point they're a little less enthusiastic. They've already gone through the treatment and they're like, okay, this was a bit of a waste of time. So, And I already did, and I already did spleen nine. No, 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 but that's just, I mean, I'm just saying this is one. Then you say to yourself, Gee, I wonder if I can like lift her up from the occiput and lengthen out, you know, I mean, you just keep, you know, and especially now bending, bending over can relate, for example, to the quads, the psoas as well. So there could be other, you know, it, it just, you know, you're just going, oh shit, here's what I did not include because no one knows in advance no one can tell you they get a patient and they can have you know only a computer can go through all the possible permutations so you went through the permutations that were suitable for this person according to the history according to the abdomen according to the symptom according to whatever you and then it, it turns out that there are X amount of permutations, some of them you can't, you won't even think about for another until 20 years later, maybe, that you didn't include. You know, so you do the best you can. Now, standing and bending stretching is, by the way, and related to stomach chi or stomach, and standing specifically relates to stomach 41. So that's another thing that I can try. Sacroiliac joint relates to gallbladder 34. Okay, and so you just, um, you know, and then you go, well, I wonder if I give her better support between the legs to, you know, so the spine is held better and lengthened better. Would inner yin and mushu do the trick? You know, and again, you may have tried it and sometimes you have to try it standing up. I just don't know. Uh, you know, so you, just because they got off the table, does not, I, that's not 100% the end of the treatment yet. And since it's probably coming from the back, um, you know the kawaii treatment with a pen on the back? Have you seen that one? No. Okay, it's a pen. Okay, I'll make sure, I'll somehow figure out a way to show it next time. Um, it is on one of my videos on the, uh, I have a kawaii um, PowerPoint and I do have a video of it. You basically have the patient, you look at which hip is higher when you put your hands on the hips. I'm, I'm putting on my hips, you can't see anything. <laughs> and say the right hip is higher. So you ask them to take the right leg to the side, which basically lowers that right hip. Then you press with a pen on L5 and then outside say on the bladder line three times. Breathe in, breathe out, press the pen. Then take the leg, keep it to the side, but take it back. And now they're going to like totally twist. Have them support themselves, have their hands on the table. They're standing with their hands on the table. Keep the legs wide so the hip, that higher hip keeps moving down. Now I press one vertebrae up, say L4. Press, breathe in, press, breathe in, press, bladder line, bladder line. Then take the leg once more back, keep it wide. They're always going to try and move it 
take the legs close, it's not comfortable for them. So just have their hands on the table and try and get them not to lean too far forward, okay? And then do the one vertebrae above. That often does a good, good job. So that's another one of those treatments that doesn't, it's not a needle treatment, it's something I do at the end, if there's something left over is that on the spine and actually it's on, on this it's on the spine it's on the do okay. under the, the the official do you know under the vertebrae in, in the space between the vertebrae and then just that's on the paraspinals and it's pain you tell them this is this will be painful when, when you press it in and you tell them listen it's just a pen not a fountain pen <laughs> a ball pen Mm -hmm. big <laughs> you know um but you know and so if you show them in advance this will hurt like hell but just know it's just a pen because it, it makes a huge difference and what i do is i often have i have one hand pushing the pen and one hand on their hip or on their thighs kind of supporting them so they know like i'm here i'm not just jabbing you i'm i'm here okay. you know um, and it, you know, it's the whole thing takes less than a minute. I mean, it, it's only when you press in that it hurts. You know, when when you pull it, you know, when you let go, it's it's the pain is gone. So that's a worthwhile treatment to look at. Um, you know, things like you know, things like that. So I, just because somebody got off the table does not signify the end of the treatment necessarily. It's it's almost like with pain issues, it's like now we're we're partially into our second treatment. Instead of you coming next week, you're already here. <laughs> we're, we're retesting, um, and do what you can. And depending on how much time you have, you can just leave Prestax on, if need be. Now the pen thing, there's no Prestax. It's just the pen. It's just that treatment. That's it. Um, and yeah, and I will say, you know, sciatica, in spite of the fact that it's one of the bread and butters for practitioners and in spite of the fact that it's talked about in Chinese medicine as if you know it's like totally easy to, to treat sciatica is not so easy to treat often you know it, it, it's a complicated phenomenon that you know because it, it it might start with a nerve and then it involves a lot of soft tissue all the way down the leg that radiates back up and you know, it's a complex phenomenon you know, it's like it has a you know one name that sounds like oh pain in the leg. Yeah, it isn't. You know, yeah, some people you can fix their sciatica really quickly, etc. Yeah, uh, sure, it happens. Um, but a lot of it's not that surprising. It's a little bit. It's not quite as bad as the tinnitus. But you know, tinnitus. You'd think from the books. You know, they talk so much about tinnitus. You'd think that you know all you have to do is figure out whether they're hearing cicadas or they're hearing ducks. And accordingly, you choose the right points and ah, gone. It's so not like that. You know, the books make give you the impression that tinnitus is like, must be easy to clear because there's all these patterns and all these prescriptions for it. It's one of the hardest things to treat. Sciatica does isn't quite like that, but it's, it, it's when sciatica is frustrating, it's frustrating. It doesn't go away easily. Okay. And, yeah. Oh, and by the way, if you're saying it's the joint, if it's the sacroiliac joint, meaning it's the ligament, another point that you can, I would look into adding is maybe liver eight yeah. or liver yeah. four because it's tendons. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm just suggesting in case not, you know, like trying to, you know, all you do is when they get off the table, you just extend your thinking and go keep moving to the, to the extent that you're able to. And then... Maybe it will get better the next day. You don't know. Um, and maybe it will, and it, and it doesn't, it doesn't. So if, if they're willing to come the next week and give you another chance, you have another chance to try. And if they're not, and they, they're choosing to go somewhere else, or they're choosing to let go, and you know, I'm done with this, what can you do? It's how it is. Yeah. All I can do is do my best. And my best changes daily, hourly. You know, and I have to, you know, I have to have a lot of self-forgiveness about that too. <laughs> so, you know, we're not always brilliant. Mm -hmm. You know, we just really are. I mean, the amount of brilliancy is very small. You know, it's even for the most brilliant people, it's very hard to be fully a hundred percent there in the treatment room and get it all done. I, you know, I 
I prep myself and do the best I can within, you know, to, to be close to it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Try that. Anything else? No, I, uh, I can wait till next week. I mean, right. no <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. So thank you, everyone. Enjoy your week. And uh, thank you, Ovi. Yes, and uh, I hope uh, I hope we're not all going to end up in lockdowns. And those of us who are, that they will be easy and quick to that people will be quick to recover. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you, Abby. Thank you. Wish you all well. Bye. 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 Bye.